so uh, I'll be taking off for the next three papers. So essentially what we're discussing today has been um, uh, how do we speed up inference and techniques surrounding it? Uh, nothing really uh, locked to the particular model and that would be a common trend even uh, for the papers which I'd be going through. Um, so as a starter, um, uh, at least for the three papers which I'm covering, um, and in, in the past weeks at least what we have looked at in improving uh, the LLM uh, efficiency, um, we have been mostly looking at how do we speed up uh, the, the training aspects and uh, or uh, not really how do we deploy these models in scale. In the last lecture we had some aspect of uh, what is a what is a good architecture to be able to deploy these models on scale. Uh, but uh, that, that would uh, come under most of the, the first three categories for example. And what we'll be looking at today is the, the last four. So we'll be covering speculative, uh, so uh, we are primarily looking at reducing latency and improving throughput and that's the common theme across all the papers. Uh, some of them target one of those, some of them try to improve both of them. And uh, we'll be covering uh, speculative decoding, BLLMs, um, as uh, like uh, the, the solution for doing this. Uh, so yeah, for the, for the first paper, uh, we want to efficiently handle LLM requests that are coming in. So LLM applications have been something which are on the rise in the recent days. And uh, let, let's say you have a copilot instance running. And uh, every single time you make an iteration on the code, uh, there's an API call be, uh, going to the uh, copilot server and it's responding to you. So uh, when there are millions of requests coming in, how do we efficiently handle them and uh, make use of the infrastructure which we have at hand? So, um, yeah, so uh, let's look at regular inference procedures. We already had a look at KQV uh, attention, uh, but let's just look at what actually happens during the inference stage. So, let's say we have uh, an input token coming in. We convert it into an embedding, let's say X, and then we have, uh, we multiply it with um, weight matrices which we have learned. So we have uh, WK, we have WQ, we have WV, so uh, the key uh, query and value weights. And then um, we compute uh, K for a KV. And then uh, let that just be small q. And then we have k and then v being computed based on these weights. So that's a matrix. And uh, let's say this is uh, a vector. Uh, and uh, this is the embedding of the, the input token coming in. So wh what we are primarily interested is in k and v, at least for the first paper. When we are computing um, uh, attention, through um, the dot product of, uh, let's say, Q, K transpose divided by root dimension of this, and then we take the, um, yeah, softmax, uh, okay. softmax, and then we multiply with the value matrix. So, um, if we are doing this, uh, computation, uh, the, the naive way to do it, we, we would end up recomputing each of the elements in the uh, QK transpose matrix. Uh, so to avoid having to recompute uh, every element for uh, us, we have new query tokens coming in for a sequence. Um, we implement something called the KV cache. How does the KV cache work? So um, let's say I have a sentence saying I am noble. And uh, we need to do this for each of the input tokens coming in. And as we do that, we keep building a KV cache for each token. So uh, uh, let's say each of these is a uh, token which is coming in. We uh, create the, the K matrix and the V matrix in, uh, we store this in memory. And each of these uh, tokens so uh, here it will correspond to a particular column in the K matrix and here it will be a, a particular uh, row in the V matrix. And as we do this over time, th these matrices are growing in size. So uh, we, uh, we can kind of say that 
uh, instead of recomputing this entire matrix uh, or uh, re redoing that computation, what we can do is that for all the previous tokens, we can have k cache, which is uh, like all the columns which I've computed so far. I just save it into my cache. Uh, then when when new tokens come in, I just add it to my cache. And this is the only new computation which I do. And the same thing for the value matrix. Everything which has come so far, uh, I save it into my v cache. And then uh, the new computations go into a new row in the v cache. And so, uh, as you can see, as we have a large sequence length, our k and v matrices will keep growing in size. Now, um, Yeah, so we need to, uh, in, in the naive implementation, we need contiguous chunks of memory for this because of the attention operations which will be happening. Um, so the, the first paper looks at how we can break this down and uh, manage memory better. So what exactly does the KV cache contain uh, as a high level overview? Um, so le let's say this is my prompt. So um, we have that, and then uh, this is a current snippet, and like the, the model is generating uh, the response, and we are currently stopped at I am. So uh, at this particular snapshot, um, we have uh, four tokens, but uh, let's say th uh, this is a model with a 2048 context length. So, uh, and you can also, like, if you have uh, worked with the OpenAI API or any inference calling, you can specify a max tokens. Uh, for like how much you want to generate. So th there is an issue of variable sequence lengths, uh, which we should keep in our minds. But let's assume that we have a 2048 uh, sequence length. So essentially, I'll be reserving memory for those 2048 uh, tokens. And uh, th that's shown by the, the reserve uh, uh, token. And uh, like the, the model can also choose to terminate early. So like, uh, if you gave me a request and I'm done with my response, I can pass the US token and then I'm, I'm done with uh, uh, what I needed to do. So this is just a snippet of what is happening into the future and this particular response ends at that US token. Um, and then towards the end, that green is another uh, prompt, with, uh, another prompt which has come in and the model is uh, serving that. So this is just a snippet of memory and uh, what the authors are, like the problem which the authors are trying to solve. So. Um, as we can see, we have two issues, uh, which the authors call internal fragmentation and external fragmentation. So because of the reserved tokens, um, we have a big chunk of memory being allocated as the request came in. And because we do not know the output lengths of to what extent this model is going to consume memory, we also have some uh, padding between the, the next uh, token being saved into memory. So we have external fragmentation happening as well uh, because of the different sequence lengths and internal fragmentation is because you don't know the output uh, length of where this will terminate. So what the users find, uh, what the authors find is that uh, based on this naive allocation of memory, uh, about 60% remains unused. So, uh, so that's the problem which they are trying to solve. And uh, code-wise, if you want to turn off cache and turn on cache, you can just use the use cache in uh, TensorFlow. And uh, if, if you try to do that on uh, Colab with like a T4, uh, it, it will have a performance difference of like 5x. So we do need KV cache, but we need to do it efficiently, and this naive way doesn't work. Um, no, you, what do you mean in that way? Just pre -pre reserving the entire memory block for the entire sequence length. This, uh, so you can pre allocate. Yeah, we, we cannot be pre allocating this memory. To do it efficiently, there should be some better way to handle this. Right. And that's what the authors uh, propose in this paper. Uh, again, just to uh, look at the scale of things, uh, before the uh, presentation, I just had a look at how much code Llama consumes. So essentially, we have, um, uh, let's say, uh, so we have two matrices, so um, K and B. And then we have, um, for since for inference, we usually do FP16. So we can say that's two bytes. And then uh, we need a number of layers. So code lama, if you look at the, the biggest uh, 60 billion parameter model, uh, if you look at the 60 billion parameter model for code lama, 
uh, so that would be approximately 120 GB uh, just for the model weights. But uh, we, what I'm trying to look at is how much the KV cache would be. So uh, the number of layers for the 60 billion parameter model is 80. Um, and uh, the embedding dimension of the 60 billion parameter model is 8192. Uh, unlike some of the smaller models which are 5010 and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, so essentially we are multiplying all this. So we have 2 into 2 bytes into 80 layers into 8192. And uh, again, it, uh, we have batch size coming into the equation, but uh, for inference, batch size essentially deals with uh, how many requests are we processing rather than the training batch size. So uh, even if we keep this as one, if we are only serving one at a time, if you compute this, it comes out to 10 GB. So uh, just so the KV cache, assuming full utilization of the context length, would be around 10 GB. Uh, so. Yeah, so th this is like a current model which we have deployed, right? The Code Lama 2 is one of the best, uh, I wouldn't say best, but, but for some tasks, uh, a good open source model. Is that 10 GB per batch or 10 GB? Yeah, so it is per request is that, in a sense. Is that reused? Uh, uh, sorry. Or just keep adding to it? Uh, so once you're done, you can obviously free it. But uh, let, let's say like... Uh, maximum. Yeah, that, that is the maximum you can consume for a request. Okay. Yeah, and uh, 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 this becomes even bigger of an issue if you consider the new Gemini models which came out because they boast like 10 million context length. Uh, so yeah, you can see like we cannot allocate that much memory contiguously and uh, we should only be allocating what is required at this point of time so that we can process multiple requests as they are happening. Uh, if you exceed this memory, obviously it will crash and you cannot do anything about it. So. Um, as, as far as what the authors concern, uh, uh, they look at a uh, 13 billion parameter model and it consumes around 30% of the available memory for the KV cache. Um, I was just trying to make the point that it's much bigger of an issue right now if you do it naively. Um, yeah, so we cannot have contiguous uh, spaces of memory being allocated for such huge sizes and uh, memory sharing is something which cannot be done uh, in the naive implementation, why do we need to do that? We'll come to it uh, in a later slide. Yeah, so um, this sounds like uh, the, something we study in OS about uh, memory fragmentation and sharing. Like that's essentially what the authors do as well. So uh, you, you can make a logical uh, simile. So you're considering incoming requests as processes. Uh, you're considering the like we define something as logical KV blocks, which is essentially same as virtual memory. And you also define physical KV blocks, which is the representation in actual physical memory and that physical memory. And similar to a page table, you also define a block table. So uh, what do the authors propose? Instead of allocating the entire uh, contiguous block, which we just computed the size of, we uh, instead break it down into smaller blocks of uh, let's say size 4 in this particular example, but um, it, it's better to use 16 or 32 based on experiments which we'll look at later. And um, if we have uh, blocks of size 4 and uh, we are kind of abstracting out some implementation level details of like we are storing k and b for each of these kv blocks. But um, so essentially you have in the logical uh, table everything's contiguous. But in the physical table, you're essentially mapping it using the block table to non-contiguous chunks within the physical table. And uh, yeah, so uh, as the, the model is generating a new token, it, 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 it has this block reserved for it. So it will add it to the block because it has available memory. But now I want to add a new token. I do not have space anymore in, in the two blocks which I have reserved. So now I need to request for another block and that block is allocated to it and to complete this particular request I use two more uh, blocks in that four block group. So um, so the, the block table is just enabling you to make that mapping and keep track of uh, as you need to expand. So uh, obviously if you scale this to multiple requests you can do the same thing. Uh, you will have individual uh, block tables for each of the requests but uh, it can essentially do the same thing. But something to note here is this is a particular kind of example which I picked. You have the same prompt but there are 
two different responses happening. So, that, which is uh, a kind of decoding which you can do of uh, uh, parallel decoding or, um, and if you want to do, uh, like, if, if uh, for example, if you want uh, OpenAI to give you two choices of responses, like if you have uh, just interface with the chat GPT API using GPT-4 or even GPT-3.5, it will sometimes show you like, hey, these are two responses which I have, which one do you think is better and then they use it to improve their model, but it is something which is actively used. And if you want to do that, it, this doesn't seem like a good way to go about it because you're again wasting memory for the common bits of uh, these requests. So, um, and uh, yeah, before I jump into that, uh, we do have internal fragmentation, but it is limited, like because it is limited by the block size because you only reserve that much. And then uh, if any internal fragmentation does happen, it's because you're not consuming that much of the block size. And there is no external fragmentation by this logic because you're requesting uh, more memory as and when required. So there is no concept of <clears throat> external fragmentation. Now, um, how do we share KB blocks? So le let's say we are doing uh, parallel decoding and we want two responses uh, for this particular prompt. What uh, what the authors propose is we, we have something like reference counts. Uh, so for both of these sequences, we have uh, blocks with a reference count of two. I said uh, two requests are depending on this right now. And let's say at this point, I choose to diverge. I choose to have two different uh, tracks of responses. Um, what I do is reduce my reference count to one. And then there is an operation which is allowed called copy on write, which essentially copies the, the block which you're working with. And then uh, only that uh, is repeated. And then uh, the, the today we are learning part still has a reference count of two. And then uh, you can continue on this in the normal uh, uh, flow. Another case which the authors uh, try to demonstrate of uh, like they can support is beam searching. So um, in and it is supported through fork append and free operations, which is again um, a part of their implementation. And um, what exactly is beam searching? So if you're doing something like machine translation, uh, there are often uh, like as you progress through the sequence and you are uh, creating the, like let's say I'm compu uh, computing English to German and uh, as you proceed through the sequence, the model may decide that, uh, oh, this particular interpretation which I thought of it is not really the best way. I should probably have thought of it in a different manner. So beam search allows you to maintain uh, particular beams uh, of thought and the issue with this as compared to parallel is that beams can be deleted and you can have new beams just appear. So, uh, in, like beam one got deleted and now the new beam one is uh, the earlier beam zero and a branch of it. So, um, this is again supported by this model of uh, memory sharing and uh, yeah. Another thing which is required for one, the, the reason that there was a reason why we had contiguous memory and that was to uh, like efficiently support these uh, attention computations, right? So the authors also sub, uh, also introduce paged attention, which is uh, they just re-implement the kernels to handle the different blocks uh, in this case. So um, yeah. essentially, uh, it's just a rewrite of the original equation. You compute it per block, uh, and even the b values are for that particular block, and then you assimilate it back into the attention score. So uh, you can see the attention computations happening for each block uh, as I move through it. And uh, yeah, then you can just uh, iterate over all the blocks and compute the attention score for it. So uh, what were the results the authors find? The authors uh, um, re-implement Orca. So Orca is not publicly available, so they re-implement Orca and then uh, compare their model serving technique with Orca. And uh, they also have, uh, uh, then uh, fast tensors, which they compare against, I tell you there in the next graph. But uh, as you can see, uh, the VLLM implementation, which is what's discussed uh, so far, uh, supports a much higher uh, uh, batch size of like, they're supporting like 30 requests uh, in parallel, right, in, in a sense. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so these yeah. algorithms, right? Yeah. Well, how do they, how do they like implement? Is it like on Python level or is it on? Like no, it has to be CUDA level. It has, has yeah. to be like CUDA. Because you're, uh, you're messing with HBM right now, right? So, no, 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 no. Okay. Yeah. 
so there is like a way sort of like for you to defining like the, the block mapping stuff like in, in the uh, in QDA level, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't think they'll have to discuss anything like that. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, I'll be moving on to the next uh, paper from there. Uh, before that, uh, we already. Oh, sure. Sorry, I have a really quick question. Yeah. Um, so this mechanism is built on top of the attention mechanism. The idea is that we can append on subsequent tokens and keep the computation from earlier. Yeah. Um, as you stack transformer layers, like these attention blocks, right? Yeah. The input to the next layer is the output from the previous layer, and we sum yeah. through queues. So okay. that means that the x from previous layers is not necessarily the same x as you get deeper into the model, even as you generate yeah. continuously. So what happens to performance if we enforce a prior that like that block is going to be the same? Uh, so the the KV cache per se is not what we are modifying. Like the, the KV cache already existed long before. We are, we are just changing, uh, like we are essentially just breaking down KV cache from like contiguous blocks of memory to like uh, smaller pieces, right? Right. Yeah, so all of this are uh, based on the fact that it's not bidirectional. It's it's causal. Yeah, so, so you have to because this generation of okay, right? Right. And also like these uh, base models are not decoders, they are their decoders. Yeah, they're decoder only. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so th th that's why you can do this. Uh, so moving on to the next one. Um, so we already looked at flash attention and uh, the, the only reason I'm bringing it back up is uh, because the next paper derives from some of the results in flash attention and like tries to bring what flash attention did for the training aspects into the inference aspects. So. Um, the, the reason why flash attention was able to improve the output was uh, one, because uh, uh, they were able to break down the softmax computation into individual <coughs> chunks and uh, the, the key inside which they brought was that we are not really computation bound, we are memory bound of like, um, and uh, the, the memory operations are what's slowing us down here. And uh, the, the graph again from the uh, flash attention paper, uh, they show that instead of uh, uh, writing from the HBM into the SRAM and back again and again, if you uh, create a fuse kernel which does all of these operations together, we can significantly speed up on attention computations. Um, so, uh, and also that the, the matrix multiplication wasn't what was con consuming most of the time if you look at the, the breakdown of the times involved. Um, so what we are looking at is flash decoding, and uh, so uh, the the animation is technically just showing flash attention and how it works. Um, but the 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 concern which the uh, authors are trying to address here is that um, if you are just doing plain inference and you don't have uh, a high batch size, uh, much of your model, uh, much of your GPU can remain unused. And the, the way uh, flash attention was implemented, uh, you break down uh, the K and B, but you don't really uh, try to break it across uh, batches. So uh, the, the modification which the authors propose is just uh, split it into smaller chunks and recompute it. So uh, in, in flash attention, uh, you had this uh, scalar value which we were computing along with the usual cam uh, computation so that like the alpha and beta in a sense, uh, so that you can combine these back uh, in the final step, right? So uh, the, the same thing happens here as well across splits. So you, you need to keep track of uh, these values for each of the splits so that you can combine it at the last stage. Um, yeah, so on a high level, uh, th that is the only change within flash decoding, uh, implement splits so that uh, you're processing everything in smaller chunks and uh, you need to keep track of this extra scalar, uh, which is the log sum exponential and uh, you can compute it back into the final value which you should have obtained. And uh, by doing this, uh, they are, oh, the, the reason for doing this is increasing context lengths. 
So you can have a single request coming in, which is obviously like the Gemini model, which I stated with like 10 million context length. So if you have such huge uh, prompt lengths coming in, uh, flash attention uh, by itself does not do well because of the reason stated that um, you, you're not efficiently utilizing the GPU as you could. Um, and you can see that from the graphs. So um, they try naive PyTorch primitives. So this, this paper is coming from PyTorch itself. So they try PyTorch's own uh, primitives and that actually works better than flash attention in some of the cases. And uh, with flash decoding, they are able to preserve the performance of the model even on significantly higher context things um, by just breaking down this computation. And a significant amount of the speed up is just because of the way flash attention sped it up with the fuse kernels and stuff like that. So they are utilizing like the 50x speed up which just uh, comes from using flash attention as opposed to the naive implementation of attention, uh, the computations which were reading back and forth into memory. Um, yeah, and it scales better for larger context lengths, which is the, the main uh, point here. Question. Yeah. So, uh, so, what do you mean when it, you say it's splitting across uh, KMV? So, um, Instead of flash attention, not splitting, right? Not very clear on that. Uh, in, in flash attention, you can see, like, uh, this is happening as a sequential operation, right, for that entire KMV block. and uh, in in um, which is fine for training, but when you're doing inference uh, and you don't have um, uh, like you don't have enough batch size to populate your entire GPU, so what what your GPU would essentially end up doing is doing this sequentially, even though you are essentially breaking down uh, it into smaller operations, uh, right? So um, I don't know if that. So you're saying basically for the for loop that goes through. Yeah. It does. It, uh, it parallelizes that. Yeah. So it breaks that down into like multiple for loops going through it. Right? So even if you have a single query coming in, you can handle it uh, better. Like you don't have like ten queries. Um, uh, uh, like while training, you can easily create like one twenty eight batch size. But if you're uh, if if you are pro like th there is an aspect of latency involved here, right? Like you don't want to be waiting on batching up like. Many queries that are coming in to respond to the first guy. Yeah, I, I guess then in this case, uh, you would have to do something. You have to change the algorithm a bit, actually, right? Because uh, yeah, because before you can like when you do your computation, you already have your first thing. Your your first you can help, you put you, you do your computation on the first count, you put it in the output matrix. Yeah. Uh, but now you're kind of doing everything and like aggregating them together. Yeah. So like there's some. Yeah, there is a final reduction set. I see, I see. Okay. Well, and that scalar which we are tracking for like the weights of each of these individual components allows us to do that reduction set. I see. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so as far as I understand, so this is basically roughly the same as flash attention, just like a yes. different way of like... Yeah, this is not a full paper, it's just a blog post. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so this is for processing like a very long. Yeah. So the, the the intention is to perform better on like long context lengths and long context lengths. small batch sizes S small for batch inference. Sizes. Oh, okay. But then does it do better if you're going to generate a long sequence? Because algorithm is yeah. like just specialized for the pro processing like long input. Oh no! Or it should work for both. It should work for both. Like yeah. For the output. Yeah. But like for the output, you have to generate it this long, right? How do you scale it? For the discussion, they only keep it to prompt lengths. Oh, they, they yeah. only yeah. like a term of the long prompts. Yeah. Not what was long. N not with scenario. the responses. Oh, okay. Well, I see. Yeah, I just assumed the same thing could be done for response. No, but right. yeah, since you're building it up incrementally. Oh, yeah. right, right, right. It's the same thing. So, yeah. So, what is the question? So, yeah, I was just wondering like if this is only apply to like long prompt or long response. But it seems like it's the same thing. Uh, so uh, the, the last paper which I'll be diving into is a continuation of uh, what Rishabh was looking at with respect to uh, speculative decoding. So um, essentially what you're trying to do with speculative decoding was um, 
instead of having a decoding step which only gives you out one token, you want to have scenarios where some of the decoding steps give you a few more tokens than just a single token. So uh, in effect, you can speed up your inference. So um, if if you just uh, like look back at just uh, like build it up to this point, um, the the llama tokenizer has thirty two thousand tokens. If you randomly guess. Uh, what your next token should be. That's like a 1 in 32,000 chance that you get it right. But you can do something like uh, in in the lang uh, in language, you don't have, all tokens are not equally likely and you can use that distribution to pick something. Um, or another thing is, which there are other papers that look at it, is use the prompt to speed up your inference. So essentially, uh, the the idea is that there will be uh, tokens from the prompt which repeat within your response. So you can just speed it up based on that. Um, that is something which authors have looked at uh, as, um, and using n-grams as a lookup table, which we will come to again even in this approach. And uh, the speculative decoding, much of the aspects have gone into using a smaller draft model or a helper model, but uh, it, it, it hasn't been widely adopted because of the issues which were again brought up. And uh, the complexity of having to manage two different models, uh, uh, as well as uh, training it. So th there was a paper which came out after speculative decoding called online speculative decoding, which essentially just tries to improve your helper model to perform better uh, over time. And uh, th there is also Medusa, uh, which uh, tried to look at using multiple attention heads uh, for uh, doing the process in a a manner that's like easily adoptable and Medusa is a more applied approach than uh, speculative de decoding with draft models. So um, with that background, we can look at look ahead decoding. Um, uh, this is just a, a graphic which they gave on their website of how fast uh, an inference we are looking at as compared to the normal decoding process. Um, and how do we take better guesses is the question which we're trying to answer, right? So, um, uh, yeah, so we're trying to essentially improve the token acceptance rate. So if you have uh, your draft model spitting out five different tokens and then uh, all of them just essentially get discarded because the main token says this is not what I want. So it's wasted compute. So we want to be improving the acceptance rate. Um, and with that, one of the techniques is Jacobi iteration. Um, so the Jacobi method is something which we would have gone over in high school, if you remember that from a linear algebra. But um, so essentially what the authors propose is that the, the core problem which you're trying to solve is predicting the m tokens in the response sequence. So you have an x you have a Y, which is your response, and you have M tokens there, and you're trying to decode that uh, regressively. And um, can we do that um, faster? Can we like just compute all of the tokens in one go, or like a specific set of them in one go? Um, for that, they rewrite the uh, regressive decoding model. So uh, essentially, um, for the regressive step, you're trying to look at what is the token which I should output, given that I have this particular input, right? And as we uh, go for like further steps, as you're building out your response, you do that for each particular token. So they define a function uh, uh, like uh, which is shown here, and um, they convert it into that form. Um, uh, so you, you essentially have a system of nonlinear equations which you're trying to solve. Um, the Jacobi method, if you do remember, linear algebra is applied to a system of linear equations. Um, and that is actually an issue in the description of this paper because they link to the normal Jacobi method, like they link to the Wikipedia page of the normal Jacobi method, uh, which is this, like this is what you study in high school of how to use the Jacobi method, but it applies to only linear, linear equations. And uh, what you essentially end up doing for a refresher is that you um, once you rewrite the system of equations into uh, each variable, uh, once you represent it in this form, you take an initial guess of what each token is, and then uh, you iteratively, like similar to like Newton Raphson or any of those iterative methods, you try to iteratively solve the system of equations. And um, once your method converges, 
you have all the tokens which you need. And um, but uh, this is for linear uh, systems, and the only reference which I could find to do this for uh, non-linear equations was this particular book. And uh, yeah, they, they essentially say that you can do the linear method for the non-linear system, and it does work the same way. And one property of this computation is that with every step you solve one of the variables, uh, and with m steps you can solve the entire equation. But that is essentially same as uh, regressively doing it because if you had to take m steps, um, it, it, is, it is same as just sequentially. Uh, but in this case, you are solving a system of equations to get to that. Uh, that's the difference in Jacobi iteration. And uh, this is the algorithm from that book about how do you do uh, parallelize the nonlinear Jacobi iteration. Um, yeah, so just to do that visually, uh, this is what would happen if we do Jacobi iteration. You have uh, your prompt, and then you take a guess of what the other tokens are. This is like your initial guess in the Jacobi method. And you, you just uh, are randomly filling that out of um, what you think the next token should be. And then um, the issue again here is that you're saying that the operations are uh, like the, the memory operations are what are taking uh, time. So you want to optimize the GPU as much as possible. Like So computations is not a concern in this particular case. And we are particularly looking at models where you want to improve the latency. and um, there is an increased uh, amount of computations which will happen as we go into the actual model, but uh, that is not something you should look at here because the, the concern is latency in this particular uh, case. So um, now uh, your your model uh, you don't have a draft model again in this case. It's just your main model uh, predicting these. So your main model says that uh, the the next token to Alan Turing. Uh, is is like the token next next token should be s and then you have parallelized the operation by having a few random tokens which you guessed and then you are saying uh, you are asking the model to parallelly compute these as well so uh, the the model says if uh, this was who then the next token should be s if it's s it should be a and uh, so on for as many uh, tokens uh, you guess. So th this is a parameter which we will set later uh, of like how many do we want to guess forward. But uh, the model computes what the next should be. And um, uh, if we let it continue, um, we use the, the, the new uh, generated tokens as the, uh, like we update it with the, the random selection. And um, now we have uh, now we have one step forward, like in the previous step we only got one accepted token and the rest of it was wasted computation. So uh, there was no merit to doing that, but uh, uh, except we updated our uh, randomly selected initial guess and uh, similar to Jacobi iteration we solved one variable, but the remaining variables are still kind of random and we still haven't converged yet. And uh, now the model has to look at all of these variables and try to compute what the uh, next token would be if this was the particular variable uh, in, in the spot. So uh, again we do the same step, we continue and then uh, in cases where, uh, yeah I, I believe this step fails as well. So in, in, in this particular case, uh, you are essentially just rewriting and every step you are only getting one new token accepted. But when you have a scenario where uh, the next token, uh, which the, the main model predicts is same as uh, that which you are getting via speculative decoding, you can have uh, multiple tokens be accepted, which was again the objective which we set out with of like having a few steps where more than one token gets accepted and the rest of it is just wasted computation. So we have we reiterated there, but on the last step, we accepted two tokens. Uh, so this is uh, naively doing Jacobi iteration. Uh, what the authors propose is a bit more complicated. So instead of all of that wasted computation, what if you saved the trajectory which the model was trying to take? Uh, as in you save the n-grams. If you're computing using the main model what the next token should be, uh, you just save, like in this case, it's a uh, two gram, so it's very similar to the computation, and uh, we will be dealing with higher ends, but uh, just for visualization, you have a two gram being created, 
and what you can do is um, before uh, discarding everything you can kind of have a look at the two grams which you have stored and then use that as your bet of what the next token is and uh, use that to continue forward in the iteration. What happens when there are conflicting ones uh, is there on the next slide but uh, for, at least for the visualization you have a case where uh, you only have one case which matches. Oh, so basically, this is like a cache, right? Yeah, you, you have a cache you implemented. You roughly know like, what the target model yeah. predicts based on. Yeah, because we don't have a draft model and it's all the target model's distribution happening, right? Oh, so. okay. But there is some uh, like failure cases where like, if there's two grand can happen in two places. Yeah, so uh, when it happens in two places, you need to do a verification step. And uh, the actual implementation is way more complex than this because this is a 2 gram which makes it very similar to speculative decoding. But uh, the actual case is an n gram. Um, so uh, in this particular case you have the n being set to 4. So you end up with a 4 gram um, with like, yeah. so the, the numbers are meaningless, please don't look at them. The numbers essentially just say what is the position of this particular token with respect to the initial token in the prediction process. and. Um, so uh, a valid four gra uh, valid n gram in this particular case would be uh, let's say you have one, two, three, and then whatever is happening at this step. So we are on the last step of the Jacobi iteration where like the verification step will happen. So th that's why the fourth token is not really there in the diagram. But uh, you essentially have an n gram being created, and uh, you also have to predict the next token based on what has happened. Uh, and there are two parameters in this entire process. There's window size of uh, how far we are looking ahead. So that determines how many new tokens you are generating on each step. So in this case, you have five. So that's why the window size is five. And the n gram size is controlling how much of the history you are retaining. So you are constructing a four gram. So that's why the n gram size is four there. And uh, now, if you have a, uh, if you have scenarios where there are multiple uh, correct n grams to choose from, then you need to do verification. So in this particular case, uh, there is an additional parameter called g, uh, which is how many you choose to verify. Uh, in, in, in all the experiments, the authors choose to set it to w, uh, the, the window size is same as the number of uh, uh, things you choose to verify. And uh, what this shows is the attention mask. The only thing it is essentially saying is that, uh, same as causal attention, you are only looking at the tokens before it. So like the, the token 1 can only see itself and 0 uh, and the, the same thing is done for uh, all of the steps. So um, and the the verification branch cannot look at anything in the look ahead branch which is why it's all masked out and then um, you have it again only attending to its previous tokens and the starting token because you are verifying, you, you only have 0 at this step and everything else is happening through uh, like uh, iterative decomposition. So, so this is for the verification branch and uh, uh, this is the, the look ahead uh, stuff which is happening and uh, they just combine it together into one parallel step uh, to do it efficiently. Um, yeah, so this is just a comparison of what the attention mask looks like when you're comparing with Medusa. So uh, in Medusa you have multiple heads and like if the first head says that the next token can be hit or high. Uh, of like a case where you are taking only the two ones, the next head will again continue from it and say uh, like three tokens and uh, for the i case it will again generate three tokens and that's what the attention mask looks like there, just uh, to contrast with what this attention mask looks like. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm mostly wrapping up. So the, the scaling law is something which they discussed based on the, the results in this paper. So uh, what they find is that if you have uh, sufficiently large n and you exponentially increase the window size, you can get uh, a linear trend in the step compression. So you, you can linearly reduce the number of decoding steps which is required. Uh, so that's a result which they find with their experimentation and what impact does this have? You uh, So they, they applied it on Lama chat uh, model and uh, they observed a speed up of 1.5x and uh, uh, latency reductions on human eval as well as the, the math problems, they yeah, that's GSM 8K. So, yeah, so it, it, it does reduce latency, which was the primary target of this entire thing. So, wasted computations, again, 
is not a concern here. Uh, you're just trying to efficiently utilize most of the GPU. Yeah. So for my part, uh, we see that LLM inference was bottlenecked by memory constraints and we saw how we can go about building a more efficient KV cache. Um, we also, uh, the authors also had to implement like the kernel for blockwise uh, attention or like paged attention as they call it. Um, the, the next paper looked at flash decoding, which was uh, trying to bring the enhancements of flash attention v1 and 2 into the inference step. And uh, the last paper which we looked at was uh, look ahead decoding, which is trying to improve speculative decoding, but uh, take a different approach rather than using draft models and um, yeah, for, for latency critical applications, because there's a lot of wasted computations happening there. Right?